I will talk about uh, heat transfer and uh, heat transfer theory and heating elements. And this is again in preparation for the labs. One of your lab will be a simulation on uh, heat transfer, more specifically heating of a nucleic acid amplification chip. So we just uh, have to talk a little bit about uh, the, the theory behind. There are uh, three main modes of heat transfer plus one. Three main modes between uh, being uh, conduction, which uh, is heat transfer through physical contact between solid objects. Uh, if you look at this example uh, drawing here, conduction would be through the metal of this uh, pot from the heat source. Um, convective heat transfer would be through fluid motion, advection and diffusion, which you might uh, recall from uh, the Fluid Mechanics 2 lecture. This would be from solid to, uh, to a fluid, air or liquid. Radiation is a uh, black body emissions or black body radiation. So emission by electromagnetic or emission of electromagnetic radiation. And you can see uh, uh, an image of uh, that taking place from uh, our uh, body. We uh, emit quite a lot of, uh, of, uh, of heat through our skins. And plus one would be phase change when uh, you have a solid liquid or liquid vapor transition can happen through evaporation, condensation and melting. And these are all valid ways of uh, transferring heat in uh, Labonet chip applications. Uh, evaporation actually happens quite a lot, uh, even if you don't want it. And uh, that's a, that is a thing you must consider. Uh, but with these three, the heat transfer mechanisms are still the same three. So uh, to prepare for the simulation and uh, what the simulation does, uh, there are, as I said, three modes of heat transfer. Let's deal first with conduction. Um, this one here denotes the temperature gradient in uh, two or three dimensions, depending on what you simulate. And K is a material property, heat conductivity, measured in watts per meter Kelvin. So you must take this into account and uh, keep it in mind. This is the constant that uh, will define the heat transfer properties of your uh, medium, be it solid or liquid. And this one is your convective heat flux. Convection. You have uh, this uh, heat transfer coefficient, which um, is watts per meter square Kelvin. And surface temperature, ambient temperature, surface being the surface from which you communicate heat to the ambient, which is a fluid, typically it would be air in our applications, multiplied by the heat transfer coefficient. And that gives you the convective heat flux. Radiation or radiative heat transfer, uh, the material property is emissivity which is between zero and one. You can look all of these up in uh, tables. They are reported for typical materials and have been defined a long time ago. So you compare the radiation to the ideal black body, which, is, uh, which has an emissivity of one. And then uh, you multiply surface temperature and uh, uh, surface area that gives you the radiative uh, heat flux. And so this one epsilon is the emissivity and uh, this is the Stefan Boltzmann constant. Um, an example from a long time ago is uh, why we talk about all of these is that uh, this one is a lab on a chip system. It's uh, for a benchtop instrument. There is a chip, microfluidic chip, mounted on a chip holder. And um, this one is the line beyond which you have the enclosure. So this one faces towards the ambient. 
and um, it is uh, heated by or cooled by a Peltier cell. You might remember from the from one of the last lectures of um, of these uh, uh, Peltier elements. Um, they are quite inefficient, but uh, they can heat and cool. Now, to increase the the difference between the two sides of this uh, electrical heat pump, you can apply a heat sink, which uh, can increase the heat dissipation on uh, the cold side, or no, I'm sorry, the, the hot side of this uh, element. And on the cold side, uh, you can have a cooling action. And in this uh, exercise, what we were curious about is uh, exactly how much uh, power we need to dissipate on the hot side uh, to be able to reach a certain uh, temperature on the other side. So um, heat fluxes themselves are normal vectors, normal to the surface, onto which you apply. It can be positive or negative depending on the direction. If you take away heat, that's a negative heat flux. If you pump in heat, that's a positive heat flux. And you can calculate the resultant for each of your surface uh, surfaces, such as for the uh, heat sink to the ambient interface. So the one um, here, you can calculate the heat fluxes as, uh, in this case, the temperature coming or the, the heat flux coming from the Peltier uh, cell, uh, which is positive in this case. Um, this one is a fan, so we have a fan on the heat sink that would uh, take away uh, some of the heat, for, uh, it would dissipate some of the heat, and uh, some of the heat would also be communicated to the ambient. So those are the heat fluxes in this system. And if you calculate the resultant vectors, the resultant heat fluxes, then uh, you can calculate the amount of heat loss or heat gain in your system. Now, um, if we uh, put this all together, then we have here the heat transfer equation, which I already showed uh, in, uh, in a previous uh, lecture on, on theory. Uh, so what you see here is uh, for energy conservation, that is what uh, this equation expresses, which uh, by means of the first law of thermodynamics um, must be true, that it must hold up, that no uh, energy enters or escapes uh, your system. Um, and uh, this one assumes no mass transfer or radiation. So material properties are density and uh, specific heat or heat capacity in joules per Kelvin. Density is kilogram per cubic meter or uh, gram per cubic centimeter. And um, heat conductivity is watt per meter Kelvin. So these are what you uh, definitely need to check in a table. Temperature change over time. Um, heat fluxes. And uh, this one is your uh, heat source or sink, external heat source or sink or internal heat source or sink. So. This is where uh, the heat of your heater would come in. And uh, heat flux here being the conductive heat flux. Gel heating, by means of uh, Gel's first law, if a current passes through a conductor which has a resistance of R, it produces a heat of, uh, of uh, Q amount of watts proportional to the square of the current and, uh, and directly proportional to the resistance. And uh, what you see here is just uh, how uh, a wire or a heating fiber can be he uh, heated up. Um, so it's of course dependent, I mean the, the resistance is dependent on the resistivity, the uh, length of your uh, uh, conductor the surface area of your conductor and so on. But if we write it down in a dynamic form, then uh, the change of power over volume is equals uh, 
current density times the electric field. So distribution of heating power, current density and electric field, current density being amperes per square meter, electric field being volts per meter. The most important property for you in uh, this case would be to know the resistivity, which you can calculate uh, the resistance from. But uh, in the dynamic form, you use the resistivity. So similar to I square R, in the dynamic form, you have uh, current density square times the resistivity. And you see the difference between uh, this form and the other form is that uh, we have also the surface area um, taken into account. Uh, so, the different types of heaters that uh, we commonly use. Resistive heaters rely on gel heating. They are widespread, simple and cheap. Mostly they are regulated by thermostats. Sometimes uh, they are self-regulating, which you can uh, check out if you're interested on the internet what this means. Um, it's possible to make uh, ceramic or, or, uh, or polymer heating elements whose uh, resistance increases greatly over a certain temperature threshold and thereby they can control or regulate the input current. Thermoelectric elements work on the principle of the Zeebeck effect and uh, these are electrical heat pumps technically but very inefficient ones. Uh, the efficiency loss is because of uh, of uh, that you cannot have an ideal uh, separation between the hot and cold side. It's not possible to have perfect vacuum between these two sides. If you could, then these could be much more efficient, but you cannot. So some of the heat will always uh, seep back towards the cold side from the hot side. So you create a temperature difference by, uh, by a potential drop, or you create a potential drop uh, by measuring a temperature difference. That's the way this uh, works. You can also heat and cool, but you can also measure temperature with the uh, uh, Zebeck effect. Anyway, you pump heat through an electric junction via the thermoelectric effect, and this can also be used to cool. So if you have a good heat sink, then uh, the cold face can be uh, cooled and heat can be dissipated on the hot side by the heat sink. And induction heating is used uh, in the industry by, uh, by uh, uh, generating induction or uh, by, by induction generating heat uh, in a conductor primarily used in uh, heavy industry. I'm not going to talk about that here because I have not yet met any uh, application in uh, level chip that would use this. Although theoretically it is possible, the, there is not really any reason to use it when most people can just get away with uh, resistive heating or if they need cooling then uh, they can also uh, use thermoelectric elements. For research uses, yes, induction might be a thing that they can do. Uh, nowadays uh, it might be more sensible when we have so many uh, inductive chargers to experiment with uh, inductive heating if that is the application you are looking for. There are also other types of uh, heating, such as microwave, infrared, um, even acoustic can be uh, applied, but uh, these are for niche applications. For the most uh, typically used applications, uh, the modalities I talked about are the ones that, uh, or the, the methods that I talked about are the ones that are used. And chemical heating, that's an interesting one where you have an exothermic reaction typically oxidation that uh, releases a lot of heat uh, during the reaction and you can use that to heat up your reaction liquid. And uh, you can add a phase change material that can uh, by the liquid solid transition either carry away more heat or uh, act as an insulator. And if it uh, melts at a defined temperature then it can uh, act as the regulator. Um, this one is just a, a resistive uh, film heater. This one is uh, 
a self-regulating uh, enclosure heater with an aluminum profile and uh, ceramic pellets inside that uh, release the, the heat. So um, here are the, the various uh, temperature control methods that, that people commonly use in uh, Lebonet chip. Chemical heaters rely on exothermic chemical reactions. Regulation can take place by use of uh, phase change materials. Pros and cons are that um, they are cheap and simple, but uh, they are hard to regulate because these uh, exothermic chemical reactions are highly nonlinear. They release their heat really fast and then uh, the reaction just dies away. Um, Self-regulating heaters are, uh, and the thermostat regulated heating uh, assumes resistive heaters. So these are two ways uh, that, that you can do it. Um, while this one is an interesting thing and uh, would be quite environmentally friendly, uh, there aren't too many companies that can produce or that, that uh, are willing to produce these elements because of the niche application. So you will mostly just meet a uh, good old thermostat regulated uh, heating approach. In the case of self-regulated heating, the regulation is internal and open loop. Uh, where you define the, the resistance, temperature resistance profile of your uh, heating element. And uh, it is by means of the positive temperature coefficient of resistance for char characteristic of these uh, heaters that uh, you use for control. They are simple and efficient. The downside is that uh, they are not really mass produced at the moment. However, you can get mass-produced heating elements really cheaply for a thermostat-driven approach. And uh, these are closed-loop control the elements, but uh, the downside is that you need a, a thermostat. While uh, Peltier elements can uh, heat and cool by means of the peltier zebeck effect. Um, however, they also need an external thermostat and uh, they typically are quite expensive and, uh, and inefficient in terms of energy. So in this uh, video I talked about uh, heat transfer theory and uh, commonly used heating elements in uh, Lebona chip and uh, their working principle and uh, a comparison between them.